Hello, everyone. Welcome to the second part in our webinar series. Today's topic is on employment. We, our first session was um, back on June 6th or 8th. And uh, our third session will be on the built environment and that will be taking place on July 8th. Before we begin, I'd like to take uh, this opportunity to acknowledge the land that we are living on and uh, occupying in the city of Ottawa, the unceded territory of the Algonquin Nation. Now I'd like to introduce our panelists for this evening. I'll call upon each of them, have them introduce themselves and um, their involvement in the employment sphere. I'd like to introduce Stacy Connor. Hello. My name is Stacy. This is my sign name, and I'm from Toronto. I work at CHS and have worked there for 16 years as an employment consultant. I support deaf and hard of hearing uh, consumers. I help them in job searches, finding employment, and a lot of other things related to employment. Now on to Bruce Belcher. You just introduced me by my name, Belcher. <laughs> That's not my first name. <laughs> uh, hi, everyone. My name is Bruce Belcher. My sign name is this. And I work at Mohawk College in Hamilton. I've been there for 27 years. And I have taught a variety of deaf classes, life skills, independence pathway, academic upgrading, so learners can move on into post-secondary, as well as those interested in, in employment pathway. I help deaf learners look for jobs, doing different jobs uh, search courses, as well as providing personal development workshops. And so I've been doing all of that these past 27 years. Thank you, Bruce. Uh, now, Michelle Chung, if you could introduce yourself. Hello. My name is Michelle Chung. This is my assigned name. I don't work specifically in employment or employment services, but I am here as a representative for deaf youth in providing a, a first-hand perspective on um, employment search. I work for the infant hearing program as an ASL uh, within the ASL services with Silent Voice. I work specifically with families who have deaf children from ages zero to six and I provide supports to those families. Thank you for having me on this panel. We do have a fourth panelist uh, who will be joining us, uh, somebody by the name of Gary Malkowski. This is his sign name. He'll be joining us shortly, I'd say in the next 10 or 15 minutes. Before we begin, I just wanted to check in with our audience members and our panelists and ensure that everybody has the technology set up just so is everything accessible to this point great the breakdown of our panel will be a, a general question and answer period to the panelists about uh, barriers faced in in employment 
for deaf and hard of hearing individuals. We will then take a 10 minute break. And then the final hour will be open um, to individual panelists to speak specifically to their experiences. And we'd like to have a variety of differing perspectives. And then we'll end with some uh, question and answer time uh, provided to our audience members. So I'd like all of our panelists to turn their cameras on if they could. I'd like to start with the first question. In your perspective, what would a barrier free experience look like in the employment field? Who wants to take this on first? Um, I guess I could. Sure, Michelle. Well, uh, of course, barrier free would be not having to negotiate accommodations, not having to request interpreting services. Uh, if I mentioned that I was deaf, um, that the individuals would provide an interpreter without all this back and forth and negotiation. And who wants to, Stacy is saying, I wish our world was perfect. I mean, it would be beautiful if it were and access were provided at every stage, anytime. If, it would be nice if everyone was educated. And so that specific groups didn't have to negotiate access. And if the world were open-minded and had learned that everyone uh, should have zero barriers, that everyone should be treated equally and that they can apply for a job and be hired. I believe that would be nice and show it's barrier free. That's Bruce, true. Bruce is saying a couple of things. In my years of teaching at the college, we always say we would like deaf people to become the majority population and hearing people to become the minority, that would be perfect for us. And I think that Barrier free would also be that no child is deprived of language. Uh, I don't see that as being realistic yet, but that's something, you know, wishful thinking that every child would be provided language growing up. Actually, if I could add to that as well, is um, most often uh, when families give birth to babies who are deaf, it would be wonderful if they understood what deafness meant and provided the language to that child from the onset, rather than having to educate these families over and over again and having to deal with oddest behaviors and attitudes because, as was previously mentioned, the majority of the population throughout the world is hearing. So it would be it would be wonderful if there was no discrimination and autism uh, and all of that that causes so much frustration. Right, to have that foundation from the very beginning and when, you know, the, the, the children grow up, they don't have to deal with all of the frustrations and barriers when they get on, out into the real world. Bruce, would you like to add a comment? Mm hmm one common issue uh, would be captions used in the workplace. Uh, sometimes vocabulary is very advanced and I work on a clear writing policy, which means that language is brought down to a general standard within Canada. Generally that falls to about a grade six to a grade eight reading level uh, when you when you're writing for a grade 10 to grade 12 uh, literacy level, then you're missing a lot of individuals. And so you can accommodate everybody by adhering to a clear language writing policy. 
uh, and that's problematic for a lot of individuals whose first language is not English, including uh, people who immigrate to Canada. And instead of writing too technically, it would be very helpful for our population as well as others. Stacy or M Michelle, did you have anything else that you wanted to add? Stacy? Mm -hmm. Another issue is attitudinal barriers. So for example, going to a doctor's office to, or a hospital, you're automatically looked down upon. Everyone should be looked at as human uh, and as opposed to being judged automatically. So any kind of labels should be, or stigmas should be removed and everybody be considered human. And I think that's the key to where we need to start start at the medical field and they need to just accept people as people. Bruce? When Mohawk College's program, they set up a new program called Demystifying Deafness uh, two years ago, meaning removing myths and misbelief, misunderstandings on deaf individuals. And so people were able to come and they were blown away at the kinds of general accommodations and how easy it could be to understand deaf individuals without having to educate everybody individually. If you have an education take place centrally, and then those people who are educated can go out and re-educate people, it makes things much more simple and much more effective. Thank you for that. Stacy. And we have to develop laws where we're able to enforce our rights. Often people feel that laws don't need to be adhered to and it, it's an unenforceable, like for example, I don't have anything specific, but hearing people teaching American Sign Language. We should be fighting, uh, and there should be laws in place that say that a hearing person can't teach ASL, that a deaf person who's qualified should be teaching. And I don't know why this is still happening in 2021. It's year after year. And uh, acknowledging ASL, LSQ, and ISL, that would be nice if that was the solution. Yeah, I agree that would be a big help in the employment services, yeah. Michelle? Uh, what I'm seeing are patterns. Um, how uh, deaf people are perceived as unable to do many things and therefore are, are limited. There, there's a, an understanding or a myth that deaf people can't have higher education, that they can't do all of these things. Information is withheld from them to no fault of theirs, but uh, information is not being shared with deaf individuals. So as was previously mentioned, removing the attitudinal barriers and the only difference with us is simply that we cannot hear. Yeah, I absolutely agree. So on to the next question. Have there been any changes that you have noticed in employment services for deaf, the deaf community and the deafblind community? I'll take it. Just waiting for a changeover of interpreters. Oh, and we have somebody joining us. Hello there. Hi, Gary, thanks for joining. Could you just do a quick introduction of where you're from and where do you work?
I'd like to acknowledge the uh, the lands um, that we are occupying, uh, comprised of many nations, the Mississaugas of the New Credit, and then and the Anishinaabes, and the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat people, which is home to many individual uh, diverse First Nations, Inuit, Métis, and Métis individuals. We acknowledge that uh, Toronto is covered in Treaty 13, the Mississaugas of the New Credit and the Williams Treaty, and um, the Mississaugas and the Chippewa bands comprise of uh, this nation that we uh, are inhabiting here in Toronto. And where do you work? I am currently the director of the Sign Language Institute of Canada, firstly. I also work as a private consultant in supporting individuals and in their human rights discrimination cases if they've experienced uh, employment discrimination and other, other realms of discrimination, I can support them through the human rights process. Thank you for joining this panel. It's my pleasure. We're now on to our second discussion question. And I had asked, what changes did you notice over the years in regard to employment services for the deaf community? Well, some changes I can speak to are uh, vocational rehabilitation services, which was formerly called VRS. The uh, VRS program supported individuals in um, employment skills training, provision of interpreting services, uh, the cost to attend colleges and universities, uh, monies towards skills training, uh, assessments where needed, and funds uh, for individuals to gain work experience, whether it be through summer employment. Uh, that was the previous iteration of vocational rehabilitation services until eventually the program was cut and um, ODSP was created, which has two streams, the income support as well as the uh, ODSP employment support program. Monies through employment supports are not uh, used toward tuition at post-secondary institution. That is through the Ontario Student Assistance Program and uh, ODSP no longer covers any sort of post-secondary financial supports. And there's there and ODSP no longer provides uh, funding for skills training as well. The employment support program states that you must be an ODSP client in order to apply for the program. And as was previously mentioned, there is Ontario Works, which is another government program for those individuals who don't qualify under the criteria for ODSP, they can apply for Ontario Works for income support. It's a much lower monthly amount and a much lower amount for income supports as well as skills training. They used to provide career counseling programs within the school systems through the school boards and the provincial and demonstration schools branch. And all of those programs have since been cut. Uh, it's, it's very difficult for our current students to understand uh, potential future careers and youth transitions into uh, employment and post-secondary institutions. Uh, we used to provide a great deal of supports and now we're seeing large gaps in the overall systems. Colleges do have their own employment service programs as and universities do also have their own employment services program. However, that's only made available to students currently enrolled in their institutions. Gallaudet University had a career center and NTID has an employment center. 
again, you have to be a student registered in those institutions in order to access those programs. Since the pandemic hit, a lot of those services have drastically changed. They are provided through online virtual means. We're seeing interpreting services provided online. And employment opportunities have changed drastically. Amazon and Tim Hortons, who notoriously employed deaf individuals, uh, had to lay off a number of staff. The pandemic has substantially impacted the deaf and hard of hearing communities. Not only um, job opportunities, but employment services took a, a drastic hit during this pandemic and we're seeing quite a shift. High school students who need information to career pathways and access to soft skills and placement opportunities are limited. I've been taking on placement students, however, through virtual means. We're not seeing placement students in offices anymore, but we're making it work through technology and we're providing these students with experiences. The Canada Summer Jobs program is running, but you have to be a student. If you've uh, graduated high school and you're attending a post-secondary institute in the fall and you're over the age of 16, you can qualify for the Canada Summers Job Program. And there's additional fundings that you can uh, apply for. Silent Voice, BRCCED, and other service agencies have received approval for those programs. The problem, however, is the deaf and hard of hearing community at large are unaware of these programs and services. So we're seeing huge gaps in uh, information sharing among the communities. That definitely is a challenge, especially with COVID. Hopefully we can have that improved in the future. Anyone else want to comment? Bruce? I would. Just to add on to what Gary was saying about employment services uh, and employment services needing to be a specific age. Uh, we received monies from the Ministry of LTD, uh, Labor and Training in order to help learners at a specific age do academic upgrading. Last year, we developed a new curriculum specifically for the employment pathway called employment, it's called employability skills and that teaches soft skills and the like that are required to get, to get jobs. And so that will be taught this fall. Uh, we also have career development, which is a new curriculum that will also be being taught this fall. And you're absolutely right, Gary, there's not enough information or education out there. So how are deaf youth supposed to know where to go and where these opportunities are? They haven't had an opportunity to take place, take part in a co-op through school or other employment, uh, other ways to have your first job. So we're looking to partner up with, with students who want to be part of a co-op as well. And so Mohawk College is famous for their supporting the impoverished community and breaking down barriers. It's called City School, the interpreter's not sure, uh, through Mohawk College in Hamilton. And they inform high school students that they can break the cycle. They offer tuition-free courses. Uh, and that was approximately eight years ago. And this year, we finally partnered with the Deaf Empowerment Program and a landscaping course. So there are individuals who uh, work in the field of landscaping, and they teach deaf and hard of hearing students to be able to work in that field. This is a pilot project, and we're hoping it's going to be successful. And we also know that finding the right career is very important because the government isn't interested in losing money. So quite often they have a cap of three years. Um, and if, it, if a one year isn't going to be enough, quite often a second or third year, 
might not be enough either to graduate. And so the government is cutting off their funding, which is completely unfair because of the barriers and the way they need to take courses compared to hearing students. So we enjoy looking for partnership opportunities. Uh, and this is just one model that we have with the School of Landscaping. Long way to go. Definitely. Any other comments? Stacy? Yes. And also, as Gary said, when they had the vocational rehabilitation program, you had the worker who was with you from beginning to graduation. The, the VR worker assisted in filling out all application forms and took you every step of the way. But in ODSP, their work, case workers are much more limited and people have to make these applications on their own. So a lot of deaf and hard of hearing individuals aren't sure how to fill these out and they don't know where to get this information. Quite often, they'll send in an uh, application form and then have to wait and they don't have anyone guiding them through the process. Uh, they're told that someone will book an interpreter soon and that never comes to fruition. And so that's very difficult. Then once the COVID pandemic hit, the need for using ASL, the visual language was very difficult and frustrating for deaf and hard of hearing people because of the share screen function. And so the ODSP offices were closed. All appointments had to take place online and trying to complete applications were very difficult barriers increased they didn't de decrease and so a lot of individuals just they've been staying home and these have had huge impacts that is one change i i would like to see there be more options um, and hopefully once the covid pandemic is over things may improve yeah wow Bruce, did you want to add? Mm -hmm. I just want to talk about a difference between college students and university students. There is a community worker program where our students and others at Mohawk College partner up uh, to receive funding for placements in different jobs. So there's job development, there's job outreach, where people are able with support to go out and gain job experience. That's also a pilot project. And uh, for individuals who may have learning disabilities, they're able to come into our program and we can teach them. So, but they have to become a student of ours before they're able to take advantage of this program. Yes, um, um, Michelle and then Gary. Oh, Michelle or Gary, Gary, go ahead. Oh, you can take it, Michelle, that's fine. Uh, again, I, I, I wanted to stress that I, I am not working in employment services and your comments are, are really helping to paint the larger picture of the overall experience. I, I graduated high school quite some time ago, but I do remember having that support with me in completing applications uh, because I did attend uh, university in, in the United States. Uh, when I was working as a supply teacher, I noticed that a lot of the students didn't know about RIT, they didn't know about Gallaudet, they asked a number of questions. They were already seniors in high school at this point, almost ready to graduate, and they didn't have that information, which was very different from my experience. The course offerings are, are different now. We had uh, opportunities in hairdressing and co-ops and woodshop and auto body and auto mechanic, and now I'm seeing fewer course offering options for these students, right? Um, why don't we see courses geared to individuals who want to work in the arts or who want to work with their hands, right? What about ambulance driver? I mean, there are, there's a myriad of employment opportunities out there that are deaf and hard of hearing youth and students aren't aware of. And I, I don't even know what the course offerings are. I can't say too much, but when I'm seeing this discussion, things are very different than they were 10 years ago. Yes, and Gary? Yes, um, all of oh, these like comments. Switching the interpreters, one moment. All good, okay.
uh, BRCD, BRCCED has their own employment services. Um, Canadian Hearing Services has their own employment support services. Uh, other agencies who support persons with disabilities have employment services. The problem, however, that I'm seeing lies within the school system, whether it's within the provincial and demonstration schools branch or the school boards. The problem is the lack of career supports. Information is being made available online. So students should understand uh, the notion of dual courses and apprenticeship opportunities. Uh, they need to understand ODSP support programs, Employment Ontario, Job Connect through um, the skills and, and employment training. There's a number of things that they should have access to and they're unaware of all of these programs and services. Uh, they, they don't understand necessarily about the trade schools out there that they, they, they could learn uh, hairdressing or barber skills or auto body, auto mechanic. Most of our deaf and hard of hearing youth are unaware. And, and we have a large number of individuals who are in these professions and that information is not being shared with the youth. We are seeing overall websites need to have drastic improvements. We're not seeing people advertising their employment services. Nobody knows where to go for these. The Sign Language Institute of Canada has created a career pathway information document for those who would like to become ASL instructors, ASL educators, ASL tutors, and eventually uh, deaf interpreters, anything working with ASL as a language in, in film and entertainment. We have created information documents and listed where they have these programs at the post-secondary institutions. Um, you can get um, skill certificates through the trade schools and the colleges and universities offer a myriad of these skills training courses. However, they're inaccessible to deaf and hard of hearing individuals. Some institutions do better with accessibility. For example, Mohawk College, George Brown College as well, but not all post-secondary institutions are created equal. Um, all of uh, all of the course offerings these days have been through uh, virtual means such as Zoom. A lot of our students don't have the technology, don't have access to the computers, can't afford a data plan, or they don't understand the English documentation, and they don't necessarily have the communication with their families to support them through these processes. Employment support programs often cannot service high school students. It is only when these students have graduated, then they can be served by these support programs. But um, ODSP should be able to just provide information support to uh, students in grade 10, but they wait until grade 12. A lot of these uh, offerings and these information sessions are provided through Zooms and these individuals are unaware. I've taken on three students on placement and we do it through Zoom and it's working out quite well. And this is through the Canada Summer Job Program. Uh, these students are coming from our schools for the deaf, but where are our students in the mainstream education system? The, the public school system and the Catholic board system, uh, we're seeing massive gaps there in the education for their students. Yes, it's being uh, made very clearly that the provincial and demonstration schools branch are aware of these programs, but not the school boards. Michelle, what's even more challenging is um, our deaf blind students, right? Um, we need to have appropriate visual setup. Uh, for example, I should have a dark background, which is more conducive to working with deaf blind individuals. Sometimes uh, we position ourselves in our Zoom on video platforms where we're too close and we perhaps need to move back. So uh, 
we're often unaware of deafblind individuals and we're using shared screens and um, visibility for the actual participants gets smaller and smaller. If I'm working in a capacity as a teacher or as a consultant, I want to be able to support the individuals and, and find a middle ground, but the video technology platforms are not conducive to deafblind individuals. I agree. And Gary? Well, I was a teacher at a private Jewish school for the deaf, and um, we switched over to Zoom, and some of our students just could not learn through Zoom. Um, there were a number of factors. Some of the students had a developmental delay and just did not work very well. Some of them with visual needs and Usher syndrome weren't able to see um, the video screens very well. And thirdly, a lot of them didn't have access to stable internet, right? Uh, the connection wasn't clear, the video quality wasn't clear, or a lot of our students didn't know how to use Zoom as a platform. They hadn't been taught how to use this technology. Right, I spent a lot of time explaining things and the students did not know how to participate. Their mental health was greatly affected. Um, COVID in and of itself created a lot of distress and uncertainty about individuals' futures. Uh, people uh, lost their jobs. They weren't able to attend their uh, educational institutions and it created a lot of worry and disruption. And these students needed additional supports. A lot of our deaf and hard of hearing youth have additional uh, disabilities, developmental delays, mental health needs. And um, these have been quite difficult times. The, these are brand new experiences, uncertain times. They didn't know how to navigate the technology. A lot of agencies shuttered their doors. Programs and services were limited and that created additional stressors on deaf and hard of hearing individuals because they couldn't get through to places. And when they did try, they were met with a busy signal. It's been very challenging times. Stacey, would you like to comment? I would. I would say that most people during this pandemic would prefer to stay home because they don't have the appropriate PPE or they haven't been had access to all of the information. And a lot of people are unsure if they want to book an interpreter through VRI, if their employer will accept that. And then they end up avoiding doing it because they don't wanna be discriminated against or they don't want their employer to be upset with them. And as Gary has said, all of these issues they're taking on for themselves about having the appropriate technology and the appropriate plans. Uh, and so many people just don't have access to this information. That's why it's important that we need to improve the employment services. Obviously, there are many challenges and it definitely needs to change. So I'm going to pose our next question. Have you noticed um, any deaf representation? Are, are we seeing more deaf and deaf blind representation in the employment sphere in general? In my program at Mohawk College, all of our staff are deaf. We don't have anyone who's deaf blind, but we do work with students who are deaf blind and we'll partner with ALS, which is Accessible Learning Services through Mohawk College. They provide the appropriate resources so that we can serve our students. Uh, in terms of Mohawk's employments, uh, there is CES, Career Employment Services. They don't have any deaf staff there, but interpreters will be provided and funding is available through the college to provide interpreting for those appointments. Gary? Silent Voice has booklet online. It's employment services for deaf and hard of hearing youth who are, 
are enrolled in high school programs, the information is, is fantastic. They provide a number of resources uh, and different services. The information is um, better suited to in person. What we're seeing is a lack of information on online service provision. This, these are new experiences and people are unsure of where to navigate online services. So we need to see further development of resources um, of, of online services. And I'm not sure if the government funders are willing to fund that. Agencies are, are grossly underfunded at this point, and they've had to shift their focus. For example, the school boards just were not ready um, to provide career supports online. Now, uh, a number of our deaf and hard of hearing students don't have access to a computer or a laptop. They're trying to navigate these online services on a mobile phone. And, you know, it's just highly inaccessible. The, the visibility is very small. They need to receive funding to purchase the technology such as computers and, and laptops. And that needs to be made a priority. Stacy, Bruce, Stacy. Go ahead. I feel it's really important to have deaf and deaf blind representation because they know what accommodations each needs. And I really feel that that needs to widen. They're going to understand what it's like working with someone who is deaf or deaf blind. Uh, they're able to provide support to their clients. Yes, I think deaf and deafblind representation is hugely important. Bruce? And just going back to your first question about barrier-free employment services, I feel like there's a connection with this question as well. Because unfortunately, Ontario doesn't all work together. Quite often people work in silos um, and there might be a resource that others know about, but based on geography, not everyone will have. And so it would really be nice to have experts, expertise who are deaf and deafblind, uh, who may know where the resources are. As uh, Gary was just speaking about, um, I, I hadn't heard about that. And having to take on the responsibility to do all of that research and reinvent the wheel is almost like spinning our tires for no good reason. It's really important that we work together. Uh, and so then hopefully there'll be more of a wake up call and we can understand how to work together if a hub was put in place and it didn't uh, for all ages. If that hub was there and easily accessible content in ASL, content for those who are deaf blind, the right job and the right information. Gary and then Michelle. Uh, blind Ontario has employment supports. BRCCED, Silent Voice, Canadian Hearing Services, uh, DAS, uh, other um, other deaf services should be working together to pool their resources for the best interest of our deaf and hard of hearing individuals, some who are coming from remote areas, impoverished communities, um, London uh, community services for the deaf and hard of hearing, need, they all need to pool their resources. And as Bruce mentioned, a centralized hub of services and programs. Uh, when I look to um, our youth leaders, Silent Voice is the leader of our, our deaf and hard of hearing youth communities. Michelle our, is green. Our high schools, they need to be starting at grade eight, and we need to be building these bridges and providing these resources to the deaf and hard of hearing youth. Michelle, go ahead. 
Yes, absolutely. We do need more deaf and deaf blind representation. We need to feel safe. We need to be looking up to our peers, right? We're often faced with role models who are hearing or as a person of color, I'm dealing with a, a, a large population of Caucasian individuals. I need to find places and spaces where I feel safe. And I'm not seeing representation um, a person of color might not pose the same question to a Caucasian individual. And uh, we need to resolve these larger systemic issues. It's important to draw attention to this. It is important, I agree, yes. From Gary, we need to see more diversity, absolutely. Okay, we're just going to wait for the interpreters to change, great. We have five minutes left until we break. So far, we've had a great discussion. So I want to ask, do you have any solutions to remove the barriers in employment services? Michelle? What I have seen is employment services are provided for deaf and deafblind youth, but I'm wondering about services for employers specifically, training, uh, professional training opportunities to, um, to, to help employers better understand the needs of deaf and deaf blind employees. So workshops that we're seeing to help educate these employers and that needs to be provided on a larger scale and not just placed as a burden on the deaf individuals to have to fight the system, but it, it needs to be incumbent upon the employers and their, their uh, human resources departments or their hiring managers to better understand how to bring on board persons with disabilities. So shifting the focus to the employers rather than encumbering the deaf and hard of hearing individuals. Yes, I agree. Uh, Gary? I would say that there's three imperative um, timeframes. So youth in eighth grade to better understand soft skills and those concepts. Um, the understanding of self-advocacy and developing those skills when they are faced with discrimination and barriers, how they can assert themselves to break through this, and how these um, youth can gain information through job markets. So soft skills, self-advocacy, and job and employment information, mock interview skills, uh, skills on how to apply for a job, uh, helping them better understand their narrative and finding supports among their peers, right? They tend to engage with their peers the most. And agencies must make improvements in their uh, diversity representation. They must onboard deaf individuals, individuals who have skills in American Sign Language. This is of utmost significance. Employers need to be um, better understanding their legal duty to accommodate individuals who are applying for employment. Um, People need to create good relationships with employers. And a lot of employers don't want to hire individuals with disabilities. The problem is, is that the agencies don't have the money and the funding to advocate to these employers. Absolutely. Right. Right, it's often, you know, monies will go to agencies or employers, but there are no bridges built between these employer entities and these agencies. Agencies create uh, resources, but um, they are not given the funding to educate these employers. And they're left with resources that they can't do much with. And yet employers are saying that they cannot hire these agencies. So there are, there are systemic barriers created between these entities. And so 
right? And then often we're, fa we're faced with geographic boundaries, right? We are stuck, we are pigeonholed in greater Toronto and yet we cannot service Hamilton or um, you must stick within Peel region. And these geographic barriers can then create even further complexities. And you know, the best resolution, as Bruce mentioned, these centralized hugs, vlogs, getting people's stories and narratives out there and providing the financial support to those who are desperately in need of it so that they can purchase the technology and get a data plan. COVID is not going away. COVID will continue at least until the fall and likely even until next year, even though the vaccine rates uh, have have uh, have taken on um, large numbers. We're still seeing this pandemic going into next year. Okay, we'll just take our final comments from Stacy and then Bruce, and then we'll have our break. Uh, just following up on what Michelle was saying, programs at uh, professional human resources programs in post secondary, they need to be taught by deaf or deafblind instructors or professors. They need to have that diversity throughout the program. So students who are going to go into the field of human resources will have a, a better understanding as opposed to only what their education provides them. I, I strongly believe that the curriculum needs to be adapted to provide that information. And Bruce, as I was saying about the centralized hub, I think all agencies throughout Ontario can submit a proposal to MLTSD in order to get funding that would be shared to provide this hub. Uh, that way, I think each of these different agencies, they have the skills and they have the ability to do this. So the time is now to create this proposal and work together. Uh, Gary? It is imperative to educate employers on attitudinal barriers. Absolutely. Autism, racism, ableism, those are integral pieces of education and you know, diversity representation in their workforce. Black Lives Matter really um, drew attention to larger systemic issues and, and brought forth these issues about ableism, autism. And, you know, a lot of these barriers are, are even more prevalent and we, we are, are recognizing that privilege plays a part in all of this. We need to stop a lot of these ableism and um, autism concerns. There's training out there, but deaf and hard of hearing individuals are still faced with the inability to find a job, regardless of the experience and skills they bring to the table. Employers are considering that is unsafe to hire these individuals, or they're hiding behind the veil of health and safety concerns. It is not safe to hire deaf and hard of hearing individuals. And the cost of uh, providing interpreting services is exorbitant, and therefore using those as excuses for not hiring these individuals. So we need to see further information online. Okay, right now it's 7.53, and we'll come back at eight o'clock. And first we'll have Gary and I'll pose a few questions to Gary. And then Bruce, Stacy, and Michelle. And after we have those individual questions, we'll end with a Q and A. So we'll see you after break. Please come back at eight. We're just waiting for Gary.
Thank you for coming back. Um, so now I'll ask the panelists to turn off their cameras and I'll be posing my question specifically to each individual panelist. And I will let you know uh, when I'll be calling on you. So if everybody can turn off their cameras. Now I'd like to better understand your perspective on employment about uh, legislation and any issues that you have seen in our legislation that have affected employment within the deaf and the deaf blind communities. I think it's important to take a closer look at the AODA Employment Standards Development Committee. Uh, the work was uh, previously completed and released. It's also important to take a closer look at the Ontario Human Rights Policy on the duty to accommodate. These are two essential uh, pieces of legislation. Thirdly, we need to better understand the funding structures for employment services. We need to understand ODSP's employment services or employment supports policies. The Ministry of Advanced Education and Skills Development. Um, they fund uh, apprenticeship programs, dual uh, courses, and we need to better understand these policies in place. Um, the problems are that um, employment supports have to um, use certain funding um, to support the individuals looking for employment, that money cannot be used for employers. There has to be a different pool of money for employers that we can use for wage support programs or the Canada summer jobs programs, uh, whether it's providing part-time and full-time employment opportunities for students. There's a separate pool of funding for that. There's separate funding for agencies. The problem that I see systemically and overall employment services is that there is not enough information and outreach to individuals about their rights in employment. Say, for example, somebody experiences employment in uh, or dis uh, discrimination in the in the workplace. Uh, they need to better understand what they can do. Uh, a lot of individuals don't understand what autism is and what it looks like, ableism and racism. Individuals need to be educated on their rights. Agencies need to be held accountable for providing this education. However, this is not their focus. They haven't been focusing on youth because of the limitations in their funding agreements. They can only provide services to individuals after grade 12. Our clients need to know their rights. They need to have access to information on soft skills. They need to know where deaf people are employed. They need to see success stories of deaf, deafblind individuals, people with Usher syndrome, as well as the Francophone LSQ community. A lot of our agencies don't provide services to the Francophone LSQ community. It's true. There needs to be a consortium of colleges and universities and service agencies, CAD, OAD, TAD, to come together to pool our monies and not think that one is superior to the other. As was previously mentioned, a centralized hub to provide general support services to the community at large. And when it comes to the application process for these programs and services, the deaf community need additional supports. When they have been faced with discrimination, they need to be educated, right? Individuals who are on ODSP income support might have uh, opportunities in employment, whereas they can continue to, to receive income supports while still finding employment.
what are the incentives for uh, encouraging community members to get off ODSP and OW income supports and, and get into the working field? We need to see the increase in the minimum wage to $15 an hour, right? Deaf individuals understand statistics. They know how much they'll make on income supports. They understand that they'll have medical and dental benefits through ODSP and they don't have to work for it. Whereas in the working world, they have to work at a lower wage without any benefits, facing part-time contract, instable, instability in employment. And so they understand the system. We need to create incentive programs, um, work experience opportunities while still continuing their income supports and allowing them to work up to 20 hours a week and then as the employment income increases, the social assistance inc income can decrease at an appropriate rate as their employment hours start to uh, accumulate. This needs to be educated at the high school level, right? Students understand, they need to better understand the pros and cons on being social, on social assistance uh, as opposed to working in uh, the employment field. A lot of individuals are working contract to contract. ODSP should create some rules in working with Employment Ontario. Once an individual has found a job, they should be incentivized, um, right? Uh, service agencies, once they've placed individuals, they should also be incentivized. It's, uh, you know, uh, they, they get funded, through, you know, one per head, well, they may not service enough clients, and it's not enough to pay their staff salary in supporting individuals and finding employment, right? Information needs to be provided, it needs to be communicated and transparent. Deaf individuals need to have support uh, based on their needs there needs to be uh, wage supports. Uh, once they receive these wage subsidies, then they in turn lay off these individuals. Employers are, are losing a great deal of revenue these days, especially in our current climate and environment. Funding needs to be provided to these employers to hire individuals and give them the appropriate number of hours. Yes, definitely. And I'm just wondering, do you know of any policies in other countries through the deaf community? If we take a look at Germany, for example, and the United States as well, the government has uh, two streams. They have competitive positions and non-competitive positions, which are considered entry-level employment opportunities where individuals can work their way up into the competitive stream once they're in the system. We don't see anything uh, in existence like that in Canada. It's all competitive employment, but we don't see opportunities for non-competitive employment. The U.S. has a great model for employing individuals to work within the federal government. A few of the states, however, do follow suit, but Ontario and the other provinces in Canada um, just don't have those programs in place. The Canadian government has committed to hiring 10,000 individuals with disabilities. Well, they have, they're falling short. Deaf individuals have applied for these positions. However, they're limited because they are told they must be bilingual in both French and English. When we look at the UK and, and their funding systems, um, they have great models that the UK Germany and the US. And as, as was previously mentioned, the uh, competitive and non-competitive mo models. When we look at the private industry, Microsoft, UPS, large restaurant and hotel chains, again, COVID has hit these industries um, so uh, hard and so drastically that um, there are very few opportunities for deaf individuals. 
um, a lot of employment opportunities call for uh, a bachelor uh, or a master's degree. Uh, let's use the example of Amazon. They've expanded their workforce significantly, but that's become far more competitive now, and it's become challenging for deaf individuals. UPS is another example. It's hard to find a job in the hotel and the hospitality industry these days. Things have taken a, a significant, drastic change. Um, People need to better understand how to uh, receive training online. Uh, employers need to provide training online. Uh, Uber drivers were hiring a number of individuals, but now people are taking fewer Uber trips. There have been a substantial number of layoffs in many industries where there's not too many employment opportunities left for deaf and hard of hearing individuals. Yeah, it's definitely a challenge. So we need to see if Canada can change our model to support the deaf and deafblind communities. I have one more question. And we need to invest in youth employment and training opportunities. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we need to be teaching ASL through online means, through virtual means. Um, people are working more from home and they're working on platforms such as Zoom. And there need to be, uh, we need to be creative and innovative about opportunities, perhaps IT employment. We need to invest in people and people need to better learn how to use these uh, platforms and the technologies such as Zoom. What are some challenges that you're seeing in uh, the quality of service provision for deaf and hard of hearing individuals? What are some challenges with management? Whether it's uh, post-secondary institutions or deaf and hard of hearing service agencies, we're seeing fewer deaf managers represented at all of these levels. There's not enough management training for deaf and hard of hearing individuals. We, we used to have a number of training opportunities. Uh, we're not seeing the mentorship programs anymore. They just don't exist. A lot of our deaf professionals, our deaf managers and counselors have retired. Uh, a lot of deaf individuals in senior positions have either retired or laid off and there haven't been succession plans. There needs to be a substantial shift in attitudinal barriers. We need to see changes in attitudes and uh, people being more open-minded to providing mentorship opportunities and on-the-job training. Absolutely. These are significant issues. Service agencies um, who work with the deaf and hard of hearing are fantastic. And other service agencies aren't fantastic and they need to change their attitudes. And um, the deaf community need to take responsibility and inform the funders that these uh, service agencies are not deaf friendly and are not providing them with what they need and request that these government agencies not fund these services. It's important to educate the deaf individuals, ensure that they are aware of their rights, and to inform them of where they can get involved in, in, in informing policies, and that the government needs to, to listen to deaf individuals because it is their right. Yes, you are right. Absolutely right. Thank you for all of your comments. So could you please turn your camera off and we'll go on to the next panelist. Later, we'll spotlight you again for the Q&A. Are we having some technical issues? I can see you. AJ, can you see us? Are 
Are you able to see everyone? Uh, I saw in the comments um, that uh, the interpreters, uh, however, uh, their cameras are off, but they're being spotlighted, so they couldn't see the other participants. I'm just wondering if everything is okay now. It seems like that individual has left. Okay. Hello, Stacey. Hi there. Could you explain your experience with your clients providing employment services to your clients? You know, I work at CHS and there are multiple offices throughout the province, 20 offices. And since the pandemic hit, everything has moved online. And a lot of clients like using video platforms like FaceTime or others because there's visual means of communicating. Uh, as well as Zoom is another favorite platform and will provide what it is that they prefer. But in the job market today, they have the share screen feature on Zoom. And so I'm unable to see what they're seeing in their computer, but I'll often be with them trying to support them and we can email each other that way. So I think it's better that I be with uh, people online for any kind of training or as well as job search when there's a posting that I see and I send it to a client we'll go online on zoom and look at the posting together uh, and talk about it. Some deaf clients will ask about what specific language means in the job posting and ask for different clarification. So we do help in that way, and we also put on workshops. That's interesting. In terms of supporting deaf individual, deafblind individuals who have moved here, what kind of supports are there? First of all, we'll generally start with an intake for employment, uh, employment consulting and counseling. So we'll find out if they're a permanent residence or what their status here is in Canada and are they legally able to work here in Canada. For some who don't have their status yet, then we can make referrals examples to Silent Voice to help them attain their permanent residency card so that they're eligible to work in Canada. We also have a couple of programs in our offices. One of them is employment services for ODSP clients. Another one is uh, Employment Ontario. Those are two provincial programs and they have different criteria for clients. For example, if a client is on Ontario Works, then we can discuss which they want to, which program they want to partake of. If others are currently receiving benefits through ODSP, then they'll automatically use the services that ODSP provides. And so understanding that these are Canadian programs, if clients don't have it, then they can go into an Employment Ontario EO program while applying for their PR card. And at that time, they can develop the skills that they might need in order to find a job. Every once in a while, if most companies are looking to hire people with Canadian job experience. And if they don't, then we encourage people to volunteer to start gaining some of that experience that will benefit them until their PR card comes through. Thank you, I agree. Now I'm just wondering what kind of training, um, would, would, what kind of training would look like in employment services? There's a variety of different topics. One is resume writing. Often people don't know what a cover letter is, so they need to have a specific training on how to write a cover letter, what cover letters look like. Also mock interview skills for those who have never had an interview in the past. 
and we will practice different interview type questions so that they feel calmer and more prepared for future interviews, as well as pre-preparation for uh, getting a job such as how to book an interpreter. If something goes wrong on the job, what can you do to resolve it? Those kinds of workshops we provide and we partner with literacy, the literacy program as well. Sometimes the literacy programs ask for further explanation on specific English language terms or ASL. And so if our clients need that program, we can also refer them into the literacy programs to help them improve. We also work with employers, not only job seekers, and we do presentations to them. Often if a client is placed in a company, quite often that company doesn't know how to work with a new employee who's deaf or hard of hearing. And so we'll provide some information on communication, uh, what accommodations that will be needed, uh, as well as if anything comes up while on the job, we'll provide that training as well. So if a hard of hearing individual is hired by a company, perhaps they're working in a very noisy environment or a very distracted environment. Uh, there hasn't been any visual alerts set up yet for getting their attention. And we might have a meeting to suggest moving this new hire into a different area that's gonna be a quieter environment or setting up alerting signals, that kind of thing. We work both with job seekers, clients, as well as employers. Oh yes, that's very important. On to my next question. What is the best way to raise awareness for individuals who are unaware of the services uh, and, and offerings? We do have webinars through CHS that we provide online and we'll provide a range of different webinar topics. We also advertise some of the different programs and services that CHS has. So that's very nice that that kind of spreads throughout the province. And if people don't know where to go, there are the resources through CHS and that information that we, we try to get out there and, and share with the community. We network and do outreach to educate others. And that's how that brings awareness into CHS, the employment services that we provide, as well as the other services and programs. Yes. Thank you. Could you please turn your camera off and you can join us later for the Q&A. On to Bruce. Great. Hi, Bruce. Hi. Could you expand a little bit on your the new program on deaf empowerment, the deaf empowerment program? And how that came about? The Deaf Empowerment Program uh, was established in 1991. The goal was for independence, uh, everyday life skills for learners to learn. And now there's a new curriculum that's been added for an employment pathway. So there are more tools that have been developed. But initially, the funding came from LBS, which stands for Literacy Basic Skills. That funding was provided so that any deaf learner could take literacy programs. For those who have a very low English literacy level, the goal was to raise their literacy. Uh, and for those who don't have the potential to go on to college and university, they would be able to upgrade to be able to do that in the future. Employment wasn't a goal at the time. There were different areas that were focused initially. There was the pre-employment, academic, which was, uh, and preparation for the working world. And it was modified to expectations by employers. The curriculum found, based themselves on soft skills, 
which was what employers were wanting to see more of in their hires. Now, unfortunately, a lot of baby boomers have retired. And what that means is that there's a lot of high skills training that are needed and specific training that requiring a minimum of a grade 12 education. And so there's something new, something the interpreter missed, M credentials. This is uh, micro, -credentials. micro credentials. And what that means is you get training on specific topics and that is in place of the educational component and then you get hired into a company. And so we partner with some different academic campuses for that. We see what it's like. We look at the job, what the requirements are, and then we modify our curriculum in order to provide those skills to our students to get jobs. Odin Ontario Disability Employment Service is one agency that we work with. And so they are a network of different employers. We were able to survey them to ask what it is they were looking for most when hiring somebody for any job. And based on the results of that, we've been able to teach our students this information to prepare them. Mostly the results have been soft skills are the most important thing for students to have. Uh, and so we have to work with people and employers are requiring that their hires are able to work together with others. People come into our program, we give workshops on different topics and based on different employers and what they've told us, we're able to give this information to students. So that's what our program is doing. That's very interesting. Sorry. No, that's okay. I was just saying that's very interesting. Oh, we're just switching the interpreters. Okay. Perfect. Okay. On to my next question. If possible, could you share some successful examples of the program? that the program has done for the community? Absolutely, and I was waiting for you to ask me that. But five years ago, we started a partnership with uh, four different places. One of them is called Rockwell and they're located in Milton. They contacted us saying they wanted to hire deaf individuals who uh, have experience with construction and building. They told us what they wanted and we customized our training to them so that those students could then go to work at Rockwell. Um, and we've had several success stories from there. Another one is Maple Leaf Foods. There's a food processing plant that they were looking for people of color, those with uh, barriers and they told us what they were looking for. They gave us the resources and we were able to train as well according to what they were looking at. And so some preferred captioned materials and that they were able to read it in training, it be given to me and then they were able to go on to work. And they're one of the top best shift workers they always, they always get great performance reviews because they always complete their tasks. Another one recently got a job at GM in Woodstock, and that is in parts of an assembly. There was some frustration because they needed to be doing some welding uh, and they weren't able to hear specific uh, alerts. Scanning. Sorry? Scanning. They were, sorry, they were supposed to be doing scanning, but they couldn't hear it. Uh, and so there had to be some training in how to use the scanner. I did that with them. I reviewed the different terminology 
uh, and vocabulary that was used at that job uh, at GM, and there was huge improvements in that student. So those are probably the top three success stories that I can think of. That's great. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned the Deaf Empowerment Program. Do you feel that it's important for educational institutions to also adopt this model? The problem is the LBS literacy program. It's a provincial program only. Mm. There's BRCC, ED, CHS. Um, there's a library. There's another college program, Mohawk, and another one. And so many practitioners don't have the qualifications to be teaching because they themselves have been deprived of language uh, and barriers to education. So that's very difficult. Now, there are probably about four programs that are qualified to teach employment skills. And I'm heavily involved because Mohawk College has been partnered up with and involved with a lot of employment opportunities along with my experiences in my 20 plus years teaching there is deaf literacy initiative dli now i'm involved with deaf literacy initiative as a support organization for deaf uh deaf blind individuals who are employed or underemployed and when you look at the statistics Clearly, there's not enough resources and there's not enough time to discuss it tonight, but that's a huge gap. So I would love to see some kind of model for uh, the deaf community and being able to partner with other agencies throughout Canada. I would love to see that model in place. The people have a right to access and to have a right to employment. Barriers shouldn't be in place for employment. It doesn't matter who you are or where you are. It needs to be that equity to the hearing population as well so that they can participate and contribute to society with dignity. I fully agree with everything you've been saying. We need more accessibility. And I'm wondering, are there any deaf or deaf blind people um, employed in this program? Well, as I said, we have five deaf staff. Two of them re are retired teachers from uh, EC Drury. There's myself and another colleague and I who've been working, myself for 27 years and him for 21 years. Uh, and there's somebody else who's been working with me for four months. So we, we team teach. Plus we partner with CHS and Hamilton, their GSS support person to help improve accessibility for all deaf individuals in the Hamilton Wentworth region, because there's a lot of frustration there. Uh, and if there was a Hamilton hub of local information, I feel like we could do that not only there, but provincially as well. Winnipeg and Hamilton have a lot of barriers uh, in employment, and I'm not sure if that's still the case, but in a past survey, that were that was the results, Winnipeg and Hamilton. Interesting. Okay, I, well, I think that's it for you, Bruce. And could you turn your camera off and you can join us after in the Q&A. And Michelle, could you please turn your camera on? Hello. Hi. I'm just wondering, in your view, what are the current issues for the deaf and deafblind youth seeking jobs? I did speak to it earlier, but I can summarize uh, some of the things that I had mentioned previously. So firstly, um, uh, we're seeing a, a lack of information. People are unaware of uh, what services and programs are out there. They're not reaching out through all the different social media channels, right? And maybe these service provision agencies need to better understand their outreach to the deaf and deafblind youth. Maybe the information out there is inaccessible. 
um, individuals are lacking in the soft skills, as previously mentioned, time management, the ability to work with individuals in a um, superior uh, employer-employee relationship. Uh, there's a number of a uh, number of factors, but soft skills are lacking. Um, maybe people haven't had enough volunteer opportunities to develop these skills, or they're not asserting themselves, and they don't know where to go for volunteer opportunities. So they're lacking in val volunteer, as well as employment experience, their resumes aren't um, aren't allowing them to compete in today's employment market. And uh, right. Oh, people are looking to expertise in one field, but they're overlooking um, the other skills, right? As was previously mentioned, uh, a lot of the baby boomers are retiring and positions are opening up in the trades. So people need some additional training and apprenticeship because, uh, right, these are some which may be considered high risk, um, high injury positions and in welding, uh, heavy machinery operating truck driving, a lot of these uh, skills require certificates. And um, if deaf and hard of hearing individuals aren't able to get that education, they don't have the skills and experience. Maybe people aren't involved with the nonprofit organizations or, or the camps. It's just we want to see people get out there and volunteer to gain as much experience as possible. And in, in that, they will develop the soft skills. Yeah, I absolutely agree. I see that happening all the time. There are some uh, previous programs like the Deaf Empowerment Program mentioned. Where would you recommend that youth go to for programs and services? Well, as Bruce mentioned, we need pr more programs like that, not just uh, located from Mohawk College. We'd like to see some across the provinces and, and throughout the country. Um, I, I can't say what's out there, but we definitely need more right? There's not enough reach or reach out. And, and we can't just be reaching out to the provincial and demonstration schools. There's a lot of deaf and hard of hearing youth in the mainstream education system who yes. aren't being reached out to. Yes, that's a good point. Okay, I just have one more question for you. What advice could you give to the youth if they're not getting what they need in terms of support? Oh, there's so much I'd love to give them. Okay, firstly, Google is your best friend. If you're not aware of something, look it up. If you're unsure and you wanna learn more about an organization or a college, look it up. If you're not familiar with a word, look it up, ask around. Don't be afraid to ask people questions, ask your teachers, ask your peers. And if you don't get what you need, go to Google. It's a wealth of information and it's limitless. So Google is your best friend. Uh, you can search for volunteer opportunities, and not just in Canada, but you can have international opportunities. You can fly, you can travel. If you take a look at WOOF, I think it's called the World Wide WW Worldwide Organic. I'm so sorry, I can't remember what it's called. World Wide Opportunities on Organic Farms. There's volunteer opportunities where you can travel abroad and work in agriculture and learn those soft skills on how to work with individuals on a farm. It's really entertaining. You can experience different cultural foods and um, how to purchase local goods. 
There's opportunities to travel among the cities and meet the locals. It's, it's, you're continuously learning every day. And if you're not afraid, these are opportunities that you can encounter every day. Don't stay home, get out there in the world, experience things, drive to Manitoba, drive to New Brunswick and PEI and experience the country. Try to get to the United States. There's a number of opportunities right um eyf looking for your future program it's it's offered through rit and ntid um, if you're not sure about what you want to do in the when you grow up go to camps and and experience different things whether it's in science technology engineering the overall stem the dramatic arts any type of arts or the youth leadership the ylc youth leadership camp it's an opportunity to develop your leadership skills and a myriad of experiences. I, I've just mentioned two, but I could speak to so many more opportunities. Don't limit yourself here. I'm talking about Ontario, right? Don't limit yourself to where you live. Get outside and look for opportunities. And if there are no opportunities, create them for yourself, right? Create your own business, sell your wares, do what you like to do, follow your passion, start there. What are you passionate about? Start a business, get into photography or painting. Speaking to my own experience, I've had so many different jobs. I uh, did uh, theater backdrop painting. I've done, uh, I was... The, I was marking for our, our university professors in math classes, right? So our university professors don't have time to mark, right? But you're given a, a rubric and you know exactly what you're doing. I got into tutoring. I volunteered working one-on-one -on -one, uh, in mentorship opportunities, providing supports to other individuals. I was a camp counselor. I, I worked in a coffee shop. I was a barista at Starbucks and Tim Hortons. And, and I, I, those are the places that I, I learned and developed these soft skills. When you get the experience um, and, and when you're meeting with potential employers, you can speak to this experience, which can be highly impressive. I've even worked in restaurants. So you may think, oh God, I can't work in a restaurant. Well, I did. I was a fry cook um, and it wasn't work, but I volunteered at a, at a fair. And my goodness, it was a high, highly stressful environment, right? Was, right? People wanted Coke, people wanted this and you're running and you're moving so fast and people are barking orders at you and okay, hamburgers and no cheese and with cheese and this and, and uh, right? If I didn't have the communication skills, things would fall apart in the kitchen. And um, people, customers would certainly not be very happy because they're paying for food and they're paying for a service. Uh, and I volunteered in this environment for a week and I learned a great deal just from that. So if you can imagine so many, if deaf youth uh, understood the, the myriad of opportunities that they have access to and the, the opportunity to meet friends from these experiences. My biggest advice is to get out there and give things a try. Don't let fear hold you back. If you see an opportunity, apply for it. Don't doubt yourself. Don't doubt your skills or your qualifications. Go for it. Apply. You never know and you won't get an opportunity if you don't try in the first place. And again, Google is your best friend, like I said. Yeah, I guess that's it. That's great advice. Google is your best friend. Yes. I thought there was something else I wanted to say. Let me just review my notes. Did I miss anything? Oh, we're yes. out of time. Oh, are we out of time? It's 845. Okay, so I just wanted to add one more thing. Okay, sure. Wait one moment. We're just going to wait for the interpreter. Could you spotlight the interpreter? Okay. One moment. Great, there you are.
I mentioned uh, international opportunities for volunteerism, the WWOOF. Um, there's the Peace Corps as well, where you can travel to places like Africa and help build a school. Deaf World to Teach. Uh, you can go to Marshall's Island, or sorry, Marshall's Island. Uh, I can't remember. It's a tiny little island on the other side of the world. Um, the, just incredible opportunities that I just wanted to share with you. Okay. Great. Thank you for your comments and your time. Could all the panelists put their cameras on for the Q&A session? Thank you so much for your discussion. I do see a hand raised. Uh, so for this part, uh, you can uh, pose your question in the chat or you can raise your hand or type in the chat video and I will then spotlight you and you can pose your question into ASL. So first of all, I see Allard. Um, do you want to be spotlighted? Yes or no? Can you answer in the chat? It's uh, an individual by the name of Allard. Can you please type yes if you would like to be spotlighted? Let's give it a try here. We'll see if Allard turns on their video. Oh, there's Allard. Can you see me okay? Deaf and hard of hearing students are, um, they should be learning first aid, uh, safe food handling, WEMIS, and other uh, safety courses um, that they should have on their resume to help them find a job. Without these skills, um, it's, it's difficult to find employment. The Occupational Health and Safety Authority looks um, to individuals who are certified with these skills. If you have these skills and accreditations, you'll have a much easier time finding employment. That's just a tip to share. Yes, does anyone have any comments? I would like to say something from Bruce. Bruce? I'd like to respond. Allard, what's your sign name? Oh, it doesn't matter, it's okay. But he brought up an important point. A lot of graduates from high school uh, have these skills that are required to get a job. And these skills have to be renewed on a yearly basis. So that's problematic. If you're taking it in high school, once you graduate, where are you going to get those renewing, renewing your certifi certifications? Uh, employers are provided to provide excuse me, employers are required to provide these courses at work. And if you already have these certifications on your resume, then there could be a better chance of you being hired. But often these are also provided in the workplace, whereas other skills are important to have as well. Thank you. Anybody else have a question? Okay, I'm just looking at the chat and the Q&A. 
Sorry, just give me a moment. Okay, any more questions from the audience? Doesn't seem like it. Sorry, my background is not very conducive to uh, posing a question. These were, uh, this was a great dialogue. I'm wondering how you would support students or really anybody um, who is looking to work in a different pro province or to work outside of Canada. Are there supports that you can provide? I know you're a lot of you are Ontario based, but I'm just wondering what are the opportunities um, for individuals looking um, to work maybe a year abroad and to come back? What supports are there, right? Do you know what I mean? If you could perhaps speak to that about what types of supports are made available. Anyone have any comments? Gary? Uh, I could speak to that. I think it's important to look to uh, Canadian Association of the Deaf and um, if they have a list of Canadian-based employ uh, employment services, right, whether in Alberta it's deaf and hard of hearing, um, Saskatchewan, um, deaf and hear, I know that there's uh, service provisions in Manitoba and Ontario and other uh, supports in Quebec. If they can compile a list, as was again previously mentioned, a centralized hub of information that can be shared with our youth, centralized repository of information, because we don't have anywhere that this information is housed, where uh, currently you'd have to look within each province, but it would, nice, it would be nice to have one federal central repository. Bruce? As I was stating, in a research that took place in 2009 through the Deaf Literacy Initiative, a majority of individuals were either unemployed or underemployed. And many employers just didn't know what to do with a deaf or hard of hearing employee. There were no resources available, no supports out there. And unfortunately, funding is limited as well to provide those things. So that is identified as a huge gap throughout the country. And if we could put something in place, that would be very helpful. It's too bad. And I, the government is aware. They know it. And we all have to work together again. CAD and all of the local deaf organizations should be working together to have some consistent and standards in place because nobody should benefit over another province. It's every deaf person again has a right to employment in a barrier free society. Gary? I'd also like to add to that the importance of partnership. Uh, the youth of Canada. Uh, need to have access to that shared information mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. I agree. Anybody else? Any more questions? Oh, Bruce? Well, sorry, just uh, one other thing that that research found. That many people, uh, unfortunately, had bad experiences being interviewed and they didn't want to share their experiences because whether it be bad experiences or shame or embarrassment, but the government needs to do better. And they, unfortunately, they can't force people to be interviewed. It would be nice if we had more information on a wider number of people. Stacy. Yes, for myself, working in employment services and working with other agencies as well, funders' expectations are that there are specific catchment areas. So often, we're unable to provide services to everybody. We have to refer them to their own geographical agency. And it would be nice if we knew of that agency that we can provide that referral and make the, the transition much easier going to a different agency. 
and make that introduction. I think that would be the goal. It would be really nice if we had a, a better network of agencies. And Michelle? Yes, again, I agree with all of the comments about the centralized hub and, and Deaf Youth Canada. Uh, there needs to be a strong recognition um, that we need to share our stories to inspire our youth to, to help them understand that they can do anything and they can work anywhere. Um, it, last September, International Week of the Deaf finally spotlighted the deaf youth community so things are slowly getting out there and you know we're showcasing success stories of people who are working in plumbing and uh, you know uh, car mechanics and translators and hairdressers and asl lsq interpreters and the list goes on and on and on and um you know we're spotlighting those who are uh, you know, are attending Canadian colleges and universities that the only option isn't always in the United States, right? It's right. There, you can work in engineering, you can work in a number of disciplines, right? You can own your own business, become an entrepreneur, you can go into um, college and university, and there's also career opportunities. So the information is getting out there bit by bit, and we need to continue to work on that further. Great, that's interesting. Do we have another question? I think we have one more question. Hi. Hi, um, someone wanted to ask uh, a question anonymously. So I'm asking on behalf of this individual. Okay. Let me just refer back to it here. Uh, what would your advice be about getting involved with po different political organizations and their platforms regarding the federal, provincial, and municipal elections? Uh, we need more deaf and deaf blind and uh, deaf individuals with additional disabilities representing all levels in Canada. Uh, we want people to uh, be able to support deaf individuals and their rights and gaining those soft skills. Sure. Does anybody have any comments to that? Any responses? That's a heavy question Bruce is saying. I can make a comment if... Oh, uh, Michelle. Well, I, I guess, uh, you know, get out there and volunteer. If this is something that you're really interested in, getting involved in political organization, whether it be counting ballots or uh, delivering uh, flyers for campaigns. There's a number of volunteer opportunities. As Bruce uh, typed in the chat as well, there's different volunteer opportunities or you can Google. I just did a quick Google search where it's, uh, you know, I could volunteer Toronto and the list is endless. There's a number of places that need um, social media expertise. Organizations need help in their social media and they're looking for you to bring forth your skills. So showcase your skills and work with these political organizations. Gary? It's, what's important is any of you who are interested you need to become a member of whatever, uh, if, if it's a pro progressive conservative, the liberals, the Bloc Québécois, the new, uh, the NDP, whatever political party, you need to become a member and let them know that you're interested in volunteering, whether in the office or the campaign office, distributing campaign materials. And that's an opportunity to make new friends, as previously mentioned. You're gaining experience and opportunities. And if they win, they know that you've helped them. And then you've created a network within that political party. The Canadian Association of the Deaf and in partnership with Deaf Youth Canada need to create um, civic skills and engagement training opportunities, right? Informing our youth of, uh, you know, who are these political parties and what are their platforms and, and what volunteer opportunities are, are they needing? What is the political process and the system? What's the difference between an, a, a, a member of parliament or a member of provincial parliament, a city councillor, a town councillor, 
they need to make connections with the civic process. Um, they can they can meet the staff. They can walk into campaign offices. They can walk into an MPP's office or an M. P's office, of course, the local level offices. There's the Queen's Park office in Toronto, and then there's Parliament Hill in Ottawa, city councillor's office, mayoral offices. Learn about all of this. CAD and Deaf Youth Canada can create a curriculum in, in a workshop format to educate our youth about civic opportunities, which may lead to employment. Volunteer opportunities create a network. And as Michelle just said, get out there, look things up, try things, don't be afraid, get involved. I think there's one more question. Um, uh, and then Bruce has a few comments. Sorry, I, just a moment, the interpreters are switching. I forgot, sorry. I just wanted to add on to what Michelle and Gary just mentioned about volunteering. Often deaf people say, why should I volunteer? They don't understand the value of volunteering and they don't understand the benefits. So quite often they'll say I'm on ODSP, I'm getting, a, I'm getting money, why do I need to volunteer? And I think there's an attitude shift that needs to take place from the old guard. Now, when we used to have the deaf clubs and everyone got together, uh, that was very beneficial for networking. Nowadays, the younger generation isn't interested in that. And they should be looking at their futures. They have to understand that there's benefits to volunteering, that uh, website I love the www.oof.net is fantastic and a lot of the skills you gain there are transferable to jobs so there are opportunities everywhere for me I started off at the deaf empowerment program by volunteering initially and then I was hired Christine Ehrlich was teaching at the time at uh, deaf empowerment and she invited me and I just fell completely in love with the program and started working there. But I got my foot in the door by volunteering and that was important. I just wanna see if there's one more question here. I, it says here, if every province passed the Accessible Canada Act, that would reduce barriers and create more employment opportunities to deaf and hard of hearing individuals across Canada. Any thoughts? Any comments? Gary? It's important, regardless, no legislation is perfect. No staff members are perfect. No MPs or MPPs are perfect. Ways in which you can make a difference is by getting out there, getting involved, reaching out to individuals. I too started out as a volunteer. I volunteered for Ontario Association of the Deaf. I certainly didn't expect to run to become a member of provincial parliament. It was a friend who had... Uh, introduced me to politics and it took me on a path completely separate from my studies. I didn't study political science. I followed a friend. I ended up being in the right place at the right time and the right opportunity presented itself to me. Experiment, take risks, learn through mistakes, but it's important to come forth with the right attitude, bring your motivation and show that good work ethic. Put your all into everything and it will make a difference. And I wanted to go back to answering that first question. Legislation is not something that we need to wait for. We shouldn't wait for legislation to create the optimal environment. We need to get involved. We need to volunteer. And legislation will help raise awareness of individuals' needs. And it's just a support mechanism. There is no place in the world that is perfect, 
You, however, can make a difference. Michelle, if you want to take the final comment and then we'll wrap things up. Yes, uh, you know, volunteer planting trees, picking up litter, right? Get involved in climate action and climate change. If you love animals, work in an animal shelter. The, these are all volunteer-based organizations where you're picking up cats and dogs and cleaning up after them. So start with volunteer experience and build from there and you will find your passion. Thank you so much for all of your comments on this panel. We have learned a great deal. I really appreciate you all taking the time. Now we'd like to wrap, wrap up. And uh, our next webinar will take place Tuesday, July the 6th, where we will be speaking to the built environment. Please register and come and have a look. We'll also uh, be talking about uh, opportunities where you can volunteer on an advisory board. Um, we'll provide a link where you can sit on our committee um, to talk about future opportunities. Thank you again to our ASL, LSQ, and ASL English interpreters and to all of our panelists. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Good night.